worship services. And, uh, and we really do want to show God our gratitude for that. Amen? Um, today, of course, uh, is a great day uh, because it's our first day at the Westin. But it's also just a great day because, like every Sunday, we get to worship God with all of our hearts. Amen? Uh, which is awesome, too. I want to start here by lifting up a few brothers. Um, Christian Rodriguez, who uh, worked super hard to get the equipment out of Heath Elementary, uh, to load it up in Jay's truck, which we got to thank Jay for that as well. Um, and, and really to get us, he secured a storage unit for our equipment that's close by to the hotel, and, and he really made it possible for us to bring our stuff here. I'll uh, lift up John Barcados, who helped a lot with that process as well. Um, and I want to lift up too, there was a lot of disciples who helped with some, uh, some moves that happened the last two weeks here. And uh, a couple weeks ago, the Dorvals moved to Randolph, and uh, disciples showed up to help them. Uh, like 18 sisters moved yesterday. <laughs> And, uh, and there was a bunch of disciples that helped them move. And there was like three or four uh, brothers that moved on Friday too. And actually I wanted to apologize to Jay and to his family, which I already did in person, but even publicly because I made a mistake there and I didn't realize what time they were, they were meeting up to clean the house. And uh, we ended up not having any disciples there to support them. But that is totally not our heart. And I just wanted to apologize to you guys for that. Amen. But it is awesome because uh, really we're here to be a family. And that's the heart of really the message today. Uh, the last person actually I wanted to, th to thank that uh, you, you might not expect here is uh, Sal DeFusco. And, uh, and the reason why I want to thank Sal is because initially I was going to go to the Sheridan, and God really shut the door hard on the Sheridan Hotel. And, uh, and after that happened, I was pretty discouraged, but uh, our awesome brother Sal uh, encouraged me and inspired me to keep looking and even gave me a list of hotels that eventually led me here to the West End. And then God opened the floodgates here at this amazing hotel. So I wanted to thank Sal as well for that. Let's go to uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, starting in verse 12. And I'm hoping today can mark uh, really the turn of even greater things for the city of Boston. John chapter 14, verse 12. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. The title of the sermon today is Even Greater Things. Uh, the Greek word here for greater is actually a very interesting word. It's talking about something measurable, but in two different ways. There's a quantitative measure. In other words, the number is greater, or the number is growing larger. But there's also a qualitative measure, which just means the quality of it is better and greater. And, and so the word really encompasses both types of measurements. And so really what Jesus is saying here is that the disciples will do more than what Jesus even did himself. And he's saying that the disciples will even do a better job than what Jesus did himself. Isn't that pretty intense? And so Jesus is going, he knows he's about to go to heaven, and he's handing over the reins of his church to a bunch of disciples who are imperfect. But then he's humble, and he's faithful, and he places his confidence in those disciples and says, you will do even more than me. And you will do an even better job than what I have done. That's pretty remarkable right there. And so Jesus' vision as he hands us his kingdom is a great one. He wants us to be able to do more and to be able to do better. And he just doesn't want that, but he actually knows that we will do it. And so he, he believes that we're going to have more and better relationships in the kingdom. He believes that we're going to have more and better faith, more and better baptisms, more and better Bible talks. More and better quiet times. More and better encouragement dates if you're a brother in the church right here. More and better family times. More and better households. More and better grades in school, campus disciples. More and better graduations so we're actually finishing school, campus disciples. More and better sacrifice for, for our weekly contribution, for our special missions contribution. More and better so that we can evangelize the world. Are you guys with me right here? Jesus said this to the disciples because he believed in us. I know a lot of times we feel like it's hard to believe in us because we know who we are and we're like, man, I got a lot of problems. 
But Jesus looks at us even in spite of all of our problems and says, you can do a better job than I did at building my church. And that's pretty inspiring. Point number one is even greater faith. Even greater faith, Matthew chapter 8. And I want to inspire us today to really take our faith to the next level. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from east and west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. We'll stop right there. You know, there's a lot of great stories of faith in the Bible. But this is definitely one of the good ones. And this is the centurion. He's not even a member of God's family. He's a Gentile. He's not an Israelite. But Jesus compares the centurion's faith to all of the Israelites' faith. And he publicly says that this man has greater faith than anyone else in the kingdom of God. Isn't that pretty crazy? And he lifts this man up because he placed all of his trust in the power of God to bring healing to his servants. And so Jesus, you see, he's looking for those who believe in the power of his word. You know, I think there's a lot of things working together in this man, the centurion's character, that allows him to have faith in Jesus Christ. Number one, you see that he's a very humble man. Even though he's a man who's been given authority by, authority by the Roman government, he says to Jesus, I do not deserve for you to come under my roof. And so there's a humility about him. He tells Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. So he knows and he understands that it's the power of the word of Christ that brings healing into people's lives. He says, I, like you, am a man under authority. When I say to do something, my servants do it. So if you say to do something, your servants will do it too. And so he was a man that understood obedience. He was a man that understood how to have a submissive heart. And so God's power was able to work in his life. And at the very end of it, Jesus says, it will be done just as you believed that it would be done. And so above all, this man, this centurion man, had the courage to place, place all of his trust in the working of the word of Christ. And so we got to understand, guys, the most important problems in our life, the most difficult spiritual challenges in our life can only be solved by the word of God. And that's what the centurion man believed with all of his heart. And so really he had a radical heart. He had a radical heart to say, I'm not going to put my confidence in my feelings. I'm not going to put it in my opinions. I'm not going to put it in what the world thinks or the social pressures around me. I'm going to put it in what Jesus actually says. And whatever he says will come true in people's lives. You know, uh, for me, I, I kind of view faith a lot like I view food. And uh, let me explain that a little bit. Do you guys like food? Amen. So for me, I'm on the keto diet, and I started the keto diet in, in the beginning of the year, and ever since I went on the keto diet, I've started to dream about food. <laughs> so I grew up eating pasta and sugar all the time, and, and now that I don't eat those things anymore, literally almost every night when I go to sleep, I will start dreaming about a delicious bowl of spaghetti. <laughs> or I'll start dreaming about uh, an, an awesome chocolate mousse cake or, or some cookies or some, or some Hershey's chocolate bars or something like that. And literally, my dreams are just, just filled with this longing to eat the foods that I love. And, and I think food's an amazing thing. And the Bible oftentimes compares food to a relationship with God. Wow. Jesus even says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, he didn't literally mean we need to eat bread every day. He meant we need to have a daily relationship with God. And so the word of God is like the bread of life. 
So when we feed on our relationship with God, it fills us with the strength that we need to live a spiritual life. And that's how a relationship with God works. And so faith is a lot like food. Being a disciple without faith is like working out without food. Have you ever woke up in the morning, skipped your breakfast, and then had a super long day at work or a super long day at school? By the end of the day, you feel grumpy, you feel tired, you want to go to bed, you have no energy, and you don't want to talk to anyone. Because the lack of food is taking its toll on your body as you try to take care of the responsibilities for your day. Well, if you wake up in the morning and you skip your time with God, then you go throughout your day and you work very hard for God. By the time it gets to the end of the day, even though you're trying to be a disciple, you, you feel very grumpy. You feel very tired. You just want to go be by yourself. You don't want to be giving to anybody anymore because you aren't filling yourself up with the things that God asks you to fill yourself up with so you can have the strength to be one of his children in his kingdom. You know, faith is like the secret ingredient in your grandma's favorite recipe, right? It's the secret. So a lot of people can cook things. You know, one guy cooks a bowl of pasta and it's okay. Another guy cooks a bowl of pasta and it's like magnificent. You know what I'm talking about? It's because the, one, the other guy that makes the magnificent bowl of pasta has the secret ingredient. The secret ingredient of, of being a disciple, of being a Christian, is to have great faith. And so faith literally changes everything that we see about the world. It makes, according to Jesus, the impossible totally possible, if you have faith. It changes the laws of physics. Jesus walked on water because of faith. He said the word, and the centurion's servant was healed as soon as he said it. That changes the laws of physics. Are you guys with me right here? Yeah. Jesus was crucified, and then he came back from the dead. He resurrected to life. That's a historical fact that changed the world. That's because of faith changing the laws of physics. Are you guys with me right here? We got to understand how powerful faith is. It changes the laws of attraction. When you're faithful, people want to be around you. When you don't have faith, people don't want to be anywhere near you. When you're faithful, it changes your perspective. It changes your attitude. It even changes your physical health. You're healthier physically when you have great faith. It changes our hearts. It changes our minds. It changes our bodies. It changes our spirit. It changes the salvation of our soul when we have great faith. Reality as we know it completely changes when we have faith. You know, I, it's kind of like, uh, I'll give you another analogy right here. If you're a fan of Avengers Infinity War, it's like you're the guy wearing the Infinity Gauntlet. When you have faith, you snap your fingers and the universe changes. Because God has given you the secret to using his power to heal people's lives. And that is the secret to being a Christian. You know, I love Julius. Julius always comes up to me and he, and he shares these YouTube videos that he watches. And one of his favorite ones is this one called, As a Man Thinketh He Is. And he's inspired by that every day because it's a spiritual principle. The way that we think, what we believe, it changes who we are. And therefore, it changes our impact on the world. Go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, we'll read another story about faith. By the example of Jesus. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And here, we're going to see, again, the positives of having faith, but we're also going to see some of the effects of not having faith. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. It says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and, and ran to greet him. You guys see, as soon as Jesus walked on the scene here, people just looked at him and ran to him. Because he was so filled with faith that they wanted to be around him. They wanted to be close to him. As soon as he walks on the scene, everybody leaves like, oh, I, I got to be around that guy. They're astonished by the presence of Christ. Verse 16, what are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. 
So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. As soon as the spirit saw Jesus, it was thrown into a convulsion. Jesus didn't even say anything yet. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. You never want to say those three words to Jesus. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. You can see the mixed feelings this dad has right here. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. We'll stop right there. You see Jesus' presence, but you also see that the, the presence of the disciples wasn't having the same impact as him. The, the disciples, they didn't believe that they could actually drive the demon out. The dad didn't believe that the demon could actually be driven out. But because Jesus believed it, the demon was driven out. As soon as Jesus said the words, the boy was healed, just like the servant of the centurion. And you see Jesus' attitude. He says, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? It's almost like Jesus hates unbelief. Like it, It's almost like it's an insult to him that people wouldn't believe in the power of God to do anything that God wants to do. And so Jesus, he's like, oh, he's trying to get us to have the same level of faith that he has because he looks at the son and he, he has compassion on him. He loves the son. The son's been suffering his whole life. And if we would just have enough faith, we could bring healing into his life. You know, I think it's very telling that what Jesus says at the end, he says, this one only comes out by prayer. And we see it again. The most difficult spiritual problems in life can only be solved by faith. They can only be solved by relationship with God. Over and over again, we as disciples even get, we get tricked, we get deceived, and we think that there's something we need to do to solve these problems. We think there's other things that we can re rely on to get the healing that we need in our life. But the only thing that brings us healing is a relationship with God. It's believing in the power of God, the word of God, to work in our life. I think the danger here of being faithless is, number one, it separates us from God. That's number one. But one of the secondary effects is that it also separates us from each other and from the lost. And so when Jesus comes onto the scene, he notices that everybody is arguing with each other. And they're arguing with each other because they're not able to accomplish the things that God wants them to accomplish. And so they see what's wrong, they don't know what to do about it, they get self-focused, and then they turn on each other. But the solution is faith. The solution is believing in God. And if the disciples had the faith, then they would be unified. They would be focused on Jesus, and they would be able to do what God wanted them to do. You know, I think sometimes in our faithlessness, we get critical of problems that we see in the church. And i got to call on the disciples to have great faith so that we can overcome the problems in the church. The truth is, is that we're all sinners, me included. I've apologized every week since I've got to Boston. And I've probably apologized every week before that when I was in New York and every week before that when I was in San Francisco. And I wish I had been apologizing earlier than that before I became a disciple. I am a sinner. Everybody in the church is a sinner. It's actually very easy to look at somebody and find their sin. But if we stop there, then we just become another part of the problem. The solution is faith, and the solution is making a decision that we're not going to just be critical about it, but we're going to find a way to get the job done by relying on the power of the word of God. Amen. You know, Jesus, he comes on the scene, and everybody's faithless, but because of his faith, he brings unity. He brings healing. And he brings glory to God by healing the boy who had been trapped by Satan for his entire life. And that is the true mission of a disciple. You know, the challenge from point one is to have the most faith that you've ever had in your entire life. 
the only way to bring the church, to bring the kingdom of God, the direction that God wants it to go is for each of the disciples to decide to believe more than they've ever believed before in their life. The cap of any church is the faith of those that are building it. It starts with me, pray for my faith, and then it trickles down to the rest of the disciples. Our faith will determine the direction of God's kingdom. Point number two, even greater family. Point number two, even greater family. John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, I think Jesus is very, very fascinating. If you study out John chapter 2, you see two different aspects of the character of Christ. And we're not going to read it, but I'll summarize it a bit for you. So in the beginning of John chapter 2, Jesus is just kind of chilling. He's hanging out with his family. He's hanging out with the disciples. And he's just having a great time rejoicing because there's a wedding in the family. And he's fired up. And then in the very same chapter, a little bit later, he's literally brooding off by himself, fashioning a whip. And he's just building his own whip so that he can drive the corruption out of the temple. So you're like, man, so on one hand, Jesus is super loving and joyful. And then on the other hand, Jesus is like crazy radical and like will go after you if you're destroying God's kingdom. And and so you see the two different dynamics of Jesus' relationship. And so studying out Jesus is important because we need to understand why Jesus is the way he is so we can imitate his heart. In John chapter 13, Jesus is emphasizing the need for family. And what I really believe is the reason why you see two different sides of Jesus, where you see the loving, compassionate Jesus next to the radical, driving out the corruption Jesus, is because at the end of the day, Jesus loves people. He loves people's souls. And the reason why sin makes him so angry is because sin destroys people. So Jesus doesn't hate people. He's never harsh towards people. He's harsh towards sin. He's harsh towards sin, and he wants to drive it out of our life because it will destroy us, and it will separate us from God, and it will therefore destroy the kingdom. And so that's Jesus' attitude. He loves the family. In John 13, verse 1, he gives us an example. It says, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to pray to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. We'll stop right there. Knowing that he was about to die and then about to go to heaven... Jesus decides to serve more than he's ever served before in his entire earthly life. And by doing this, he sets an example for the disciples, and then he challenges the disciples to do the exact same thing. At the very heart of Jesus' ministry was the unbreakable bond of spiritual family. No matter how hard the situation was going in his life. No matter how hard things were, he said the the answer to everything is we're going to get down on our knees, we're going to roll up our sleeves, and we're going to wash each other's feet. And if we serve each other with all of our heart, just like Jesus, then we'll have an incredible family that, that literally will stand even the attacks of Satan himself. Because nothing can break the spiritual bond of family. You know, Jesus, he served no matter what. Why? Because family. He loved the family. Jesus put the disciples above himself. Why? Because family. He loved the spiritual family. Jesus used his unlimited power, his unlimited time, his unlimited resources to take full responsibility for the well-being of every single Christian. Why? Because of family. Because he loves the spiritual family. Jesus spent time with the disciples whenever he possibly could. 
Why? Because of family. He loved the spiritual family. You know, this was Jesus' heart, and so he expected everybody born into the kingdom to have the same heart. And, it, and honestly, for us, it's a very difficult heart to understand. Peter, if you read the whole passage, had no idea what Jesus was doing. He was very confused. Jesus says, I know you don't even understand what I'm doing right here. But I'm doing it now so that when you are trying to be a disciple later, you'll remember what happened right here. And you'll imitate my heart and my actions and just flat serve each other and love each other more than you love yourself. And that is the calling of being a disciple. Admittedly, it's difficult for us to do, but it is something that we need to do. It's at the heart of being a Christian, loving God and loving each other. You know, I really do genuinely want to lift up the Boston International Christian Church. Because honestly, you guys have been serving your hearts out. I mean, I've seen more disciples waking up early, staying up late, uh, getting off work, and then just going to help people move, serving in weddings, multiple weddings that are coming up, you know, just doing whatever it takes to serve the family. People getting here early to help set up the chairs. When I showed up, they had already set up the whole room, and then I said, hey guys, I don't like it set up like that. Let's change the entire room. And then all the disciples just immediately started changing the entire setup of the room so that we could have a cranking worship service this morning. I mean, the disciple, you guys have a serving heart, and I want to lift you up for that. But every single disciple needs to have this heart. Amen. Go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And I'm going to read one super convicting scripture. And then I'm going to read another one that's kind of inspiring. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. It says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Uh, on one hand, you see a warning, a warning from the scriptures. If we don't love each other, then it's a salvation issue. Jesus is equating hatred for our brother to murder, which is the same thing that he says in the Gospels. Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and this is the, uh, the positive side of the same coin right here. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. We'll stop right there. You know, we need to love each other, not for our own benefit, but even because at the heart of loving each other is understanding the heart of God, understanding the love of God. When we don't love each other and we don't show our love by our actions, we actually miss out on a deep understanding of God's own heart. And that's why it says, to love your brother is to love God. If we don't love our brother, then we don't know how to love God. Because God loves us. God's heart is to serve the disciples. And so if we don't have that heart, then we're missing something in our relationship with God. Wow. Serving, serving, God serving each other is a relationship with God issue. It, it's, we have to be deeper in our relationship with God. We have to connect with God on a deeper level so that we can imitate his heart. You know, I want to challenge us. We, we have a lot of things coming up. We've got a lot of events coming up. And I want to challenge you guys to embrace these events, not as just meetings of the body, but as an opportunity to love God's kingdom, as an opportunity to serve God's kingdom. We've got the Labor Day picnic tomorrow, and I, and I hope everybody's super encouraged and fired up to just go be with the family and have a fun time with each other. We can't just show up to church every Sunday. We've got to be able to even have fun with each other and, and have picnics with each other and have a good time and build family. We've got... A bunch of retreats coming up. I want to encourage you guys to be a part of these retreats so you can build closer family with your brothers and sisters. Never miss a day without encouraging your brothers and sisters. If you're a brother, never miss a weekend to take your sisters out on a date. These are important things that we do so that we can build each other up in the body of Christ. You know, the reason why, why we have discipling times is so that we can speak the truth to each other in love. And the Bible calls us in our discipling relationships to build one another up so that we can become mature and attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Jesus, he spoke the truth in love, not harshly, but in love, so that he could build up the disciples so that they would, they would mature to the fullness of the full measure of an understanding of Christ. You're like, that, that's exactly what God's heart is for every single one of us. Amen. This is why we commit ourselves to giving financial sacrifices while we give our weekly contribution. It's not just because the church wants your money. It's so that we can meet the needs of the kingdom of God. 
This is why we have special missions contribution. The reason is always the same, because we love the family of God. We're taking care of not only ourselves, but we're an international fellowship that even takes care of churches in Haiti, in India, in China, in all over the world, literally, so that we can build God's kingdom, not just in Boston, but everywhere in the world. Our brothers and sisters need our sacrifice so that they can be built up and so that the kingdom can grow. Our goal for the special missions contribution is $30,000 for this fall, which is actually, I think, a very easy, doable goal. You might be saying, why would you say that's a very easy, doable goal? Well, I just moved here from Brooklyn, where my last special missions goal in a church of 34, a ministry of 34, was $114,000. So I'm fired up right now to see that number, 30,000. I'm like, I've never seen a better number than 30,000. That's the best number I've ever seen in my life. So for me, this is a great opportunity to blow special missions out right here. And I want to encourage you that if broke disciples in Brooklyn can give tens of thousands of dollars that we never thought we had, that we can do the same thing in the great city of Boston. Money, money has no value. I just want you guys to understand that. We do need it in the world, but it has no value for us spiritually. Money is nothing. Love is everything. Family is everything. And we've got to be willing to sacrifice our money for love and for family. The goal is 30000 so I broke it up, and, uh, and it's, there's different goals for different ministries. So for the teens ministry, it's $200 per disciple. For the campus ministry, it's $400 per disciple. For the singles ministry, it's $600 per disciple. And for the marrieds ministry, it's $800 for the married couple. And so this actually doesn't, these seem like very great goals to me. Yes. Goals that we could totally blow out of the park and see God's kingdom grow in a great way all over the world. For us, we don't know, Jesus knew that he was going to the cross. We don't know when we're going to go to heaven. We don't know. We don't know when our last day is. And so we should be even more urgent for giving everything that we have right now. We don't want to leave this earth with the regret that we didn't lay it all on the line for our brothers and our sisters in the kingdom. Point number three, even greater fruit. Go to Acts chapter 2. It's our last point. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to the fellowship, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We'll stop right there. Point number three is even greater fruit. You know, Jesus' promise in John 14, which we read at the beginning, was the disciples would do even greater things. God bless you. The disciples would do even greater things. And then you look at this passage as the very first day of God's kingdom coming into the world after Jesus goes to heaven. And did they do greater things? Jesus' ministry had 120 disciples. In one day, that went from 120 to 3,120. In one day, the promise that Jesus made by placing his confidence in the disciples came true. In one day. And you look at this passage, and it's so powerful because you see their devotion. Their devotion to God, but their devotion to each other. And so it's everything we already talked about. They had great faith. They had great family. And if you take great faith and you add it to great family, you get great fruit. The evidence of our faith and the evidence of our love is that we're fruitful every single day. Isn't that pretty awesome? Imagine if God was bringing people into the kingdom every single day. I mean, that would just fire you up to see people like Michael healed from spiritual bondage every single day. I mean, you don't see anything like that in the world. Self-help books don't do that. A relationship with God does that. And, we, and God is saying, we're the church that's going to do it. The church of the disciples. For us, the way to have the world impact is to do it God's way. To give everything that we have to being faithful, 
to being loving and to being fruitful. And if we do that, then we will absolutely change the world in our generation. And we already have historical proof that it's possible because that's exactly what the disciples did in the first century. You know, the GLC, uh, I love my wife, by the way. She's incredible. Now you guys know why I married her. Man, she is way more awesome and spiritual than me. She's incredible. But the GLC was, even for me, I think the best GLC I've ever been to. And I'm not just saying that to, like, pitch the GLC to people. Because, honestly, I don't have a salesman's bone in my body. That's not who I am. I'm like a computer geek, not a salesman. And, and so I went to the GLC, and the reason why it was my favorite GLC is because it moved my heart more than my heart's been moved in a very long time. And, and the messages that people preached inspired me inspired me and helped me to understand that there's a lot of people in the world that are hurting. My favorite message was the message that Tim Kernan delivered in the Kingdom Banquet. And if you were there, he had no points in his sermon. There was not a single point. He read a few scriptures that were loosely associated to a story that he told, and that was his entire sermon. And the whole point was he was telling a personal story. He said, there's a neighbor that lives in my community, I've been seeing him working in my community for a year and serving and doing different things. He seems like he doesn't have a job. I was always wondering why he was around all the time. But in my shame, I never shared my faith with him. After a year went by, I decided I need to repent. I need to talk to this guy. And so he goes outside. He talks to his neighbor. And he finds out that he had been injured on the job as a police officer a year prior. And his injury caused him to be laid off from the police force because he couldn't serve. And the police force had then, his particular police force in L.A., sent a memo out to all the other police officers and said, do not talk to him anymore because they didn't want him to have conversations that could become evidence for a lawsuit against the police department. And, and so he lost all of his friendships. And so he was totally alone for a year until Tim Kernan shared his faith with him and took him out to lunch. And while they were having lunch, the man shared with Tim, I haven't talked to anybody that, that I consider a friend for over a year. And I'm super lonely. And then they built a friendship. The man started studying the Bible. And in the sermon, Tim uh, points him out. He's there in the crowd at the banquet. The man stands up, and then we all stand up. We just start applauding for him. And literally, people are just weeping. Like, I'm crying. Tyler's crying. <laughs> we're all crying. And we're just fired up. And then Tim says, it says to the guy, now you have thousands of of people all over the world who are your, not just your friends, but your family. Yeah. And we're all just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I realized there's so many people that I don't share my faith with. And I assume that it's not a big deal, but they're hurting. And they're looking for God, and they're all alone, and the disciples just need to talk to them. And that's why my heart was really moved by the GLC. You know, I, I come back from the GLC making a decision that I'm just going to share my faith more than I ever have before in my life. And it's not just because, but it's because I want to love people more than I ever have before in my life. And that is the heart of Jesus Christ. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And we'll close out with this scripture. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that has come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but serving you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look in to these things. We'll stop right there. You know, the challenge here is don't miss the forest for the trees. Too often as disciples, we get focused on all the details of our life, all the hurts, all the suffering, all the pain, all the trials, all the details of our responsibility, all the details of things that we'd like to see different in the world or in the church. And we lose sight of what really matters in our relationship with God, which is the salvation of our souls and the salvation of the souls of mankind. And that's what this is all about. Everything that we do as Christians is about the salvation of the souls of every man and woman on the face of the planet. Everything in the Bible, it says, everything in the Bible through the prophets pointed to the deliverance of the souls of mankind through the sacrifice of Christ. And it says the prophets longed to see it. They were wondering what the spirit of Christ working in them was pointing to. Because they didn't get a chance to see the sacrifice of Jesus. But, but we see it. The disciples see it. It says at the end, the angels long to understand it. You're like, the angels don't even, they can't even comprehend the gift of salvation that we've been given. But God gives it to humans, to, to imperfect mankind, so that we can be saved. You know, I remember how God worked through imperfect people to save my soul. Do you remember how God worked through imperfect people to save your soul? Now it's our job. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be faithful. Remember what God did through the people that saved you. And let's go out and let's save more people. It says in the scriptures, prepare your minds for action. Do not be stuck in the paralysis of analysis. Life is not that complicated. Love God and love people. As we go into the fall, let's move on to even greater faith. Let's embrace one another as even greater family, and let's look forward to an even greater harvest of righteousness in our own personal lives and of the baptisms that's going to bring healing to the city of Boston. To God be the glory.